Section forty two of the Minister's Wooing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Davis. The Minister's Wooing by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter thirty seven. It is a hard condition of our existence here that every exaltation must have its depression. God will not let us have heaven here below but only such glimpses and faint showings as parents sometimes give to children when they show them beforehand the jewellery and pictures and stores of rare and curious treasures which they hold in store for the possession of their riper years so it very often happens that the man who entranced by some rapturous excitement has gone to bed an angel feeling as if all sin were for ever vanquished and he himself immutably grounded in love may wake the next morning with a sick headache and if he be not careful may scold about his breakfast like a miserable sinner we will not say that our dear little mary rose in this condition next morning for although she had the headache she had one of those natures in which somehow or other the combative element seems to be left out so that no one ever knew her to speak a fretful word but still as we have observed she had the headache and the depression and then came the slow creeping sense of awakening up through all her heart and soul of a thousand thousand things that could be said only to one person and that person one that it would be temptation and danger to say them to she came out of her room to her morning work with a face resolved and calm but expressive of languor with slight signs of some inward struggle madame de frontignac who had already heard the intelligence threw two or three of her bright glances upon her at breakfast and at once divined how the matter stood she was of a nature so delicately sensitive to the most refined shades of honour that she apprehended at once that there must be a conflict though judging by her own impulsive nature she made no doubt that all would at once go down before the mighty force of reawakened love after breakfast she would insist upon following mary about through all her avocations she possessed herself of a towel and would wipe the teacups and saucers while mary washed she clinked the glasses and rattled the cups and spoons and stepped about as briskly as if she had two or three breezes to carry her train and chattered half english and half french for the sake of bringing into mary's cheek the shy slow dimples that she liked to watch but still mrs scudder was around with an air as provident and forbidding as that of a setting hen who watches her nest nor was it till after all things had been cleared away in the house and mary had gone up into her little attic to spin that the opportunity long sought came of diving to the bottom of this mystery enfin marie nous voilà are you not going to tell me anything when i have turned my heart out to you like a bag Cher enfant how happy you must be she said embracing her yes i am very happy said mary with calm gravity very happy said madame de frontignac mimicking her manner is that the way you american girls show it when you are very happy come come ma belle tell little virginie something thou hast seen this hero this wandering ulysses he has come back at last the tapestry will not be quite as long as penelope's speak to me of him has he beautiful black eyes and hair that curls like a grapevine tell me ma belle i only saw him a little while said mary and i felt a great deal more than i saw he could not have been any clearer to me than he always has been in my mind but i think said madame de frontignac seating mary as was her wont and sitting down at her feet i think you are a little triste about this very likely you pity the poor priest it is sad for him but a good priest has the church for his bride you know you do not think said mary speaking seriously that i shall break my promise given before god to this good man mon dieu mon enfant you do not mean to marry the priest after all quelle idée but i promised him said mary madame de frontignac threw up her hands with an expression of vexation 
what a pity my little one you are not in the true church any good priest could dispense you from that i do not believe said mary in any earthly power that can dispense us from solemn obligations which we have assumed before god and on which we have suffered others to build the most precious hopes if james had won the affections of some girl thinking as i do i should not feel it right for him to leave her and come to me the bible says that the just man is he that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not this is the sublime of duty said madame de frontignac who with the airy facility of her race never lost her appreciation of the fine points of anything that went on under her eyes but nevertheless she was inwardly resolved that picturesque as this sublime of duty was it must not be allowed to pass beyond the limits of a fine art and so she recommenced mais c'est absurde this beautiful young man with his black eyes and his curls a real hero a theseus mary just come home from killing a minotaur and loves you with his whole heart and this dreadful promise why haven't you any sort of people in your church that can unbind you from promises i should think the good priest himself would do it perhaps he would said mary if i would ask him but that would be the equivalent to a breach of it of course no man would marry a woman that asked to be dispensed you are an angel of delicacy my child c'est admirable but after all mary this is not well listen now to me you are a very sweet saint and very strong in goodness i think you must have a very strong angel that takes care of you but think cher enfant think what it is to marry one man while you love another but i love the doctor said mary evasively love said madame de frontignac oh marie you may love him well but you and i both know there is something deeper than that what will you do with this young man must he move away from this place and not be with his poor mother any more or can you see him and hear him and be with him after your marriage and not feel that you love him more than your husband i should hope that god would help me to feel right said mary i am very much afraid he will not ma chere said madame i asked him a great many times to help me when i found how wrong it all was and he did not you remember what you told me the other day that if i would do right i must not see that man any more you will have to ask him to go away from this place you can never see him for this love will never die till you die that you may be sure of is it wise is it right dear little one must he leave his home for ever for you or must you struggle always and grow whiter and whiter and whiter and fade away into heaven like the moon this morning and nobody know what is the matter people will say you have the liver complaint or the consumption or something nobody ever knows what we women die of poor mary's conscience was fairly posed this appeal struck upon her sense of right as having its grounds she felt inexpressibly confused and distressed oh i wish somebody would tell me exactly what is right she said well i will said madame de frontignac go down to the dear priest and tell him the whole truth my dear child do you think if he should ever find it out after your marriage he would think you used him right and yet mother does not think so mother does not wish me to tell him pauvrette always the mother yes it is always the mothers that stand in the way of the lovers why cannot she marry the priest herself she said between her teeth and then looked up startled and guilty to see if mary had heard her i cannot said mary i cannot go against my conscience and my mother and my best friend at this moment the conference was cut short by mrs scudder's provident footstep on the garret stairs a vague suspicion of something french had haunted her during her dairy work and she resolved to come and put a stop to the interview 
by telling mary that miss prissy wanted her to come and be measured for the skirt of her dress mrs scudder by the use of that sixth sense peculiar to mothers had divined that there had been some agitating conference and had she been questioned about it her guesses as to what it might be would probably have given no bad resume of the real state of the case she was inwardly resolved that there should be no more such for the present and kept mary employed about various matters relating to the dresses so scrupulously that there was no opportunity for anything more of the sort that day in the evening james marvin came down and was welcomed with the greatest demonstrations of joy by all but mary who sat distant and embarrassed after the first salutations had passed the doctor was innocently parental but we fear that there was small reciprocation of the sentiments he expressed on the part of the young man miss prissy indeed had had her heart somewhat touched as good little women's hearts are apt to be by a true love story and had hinted something of her feelings to mrs scudder in a manner which brought such a severe rejoinder as quite humbled and abashed her so that she coweringly took refuge under her former declaration that to be sure there couldn't be any man in the world better worthy of mary than the doctor well still at her heart she was possessed with that troublesome preference for unworthy people which stands in the way of so many excellent things but she went on vigorously sewing on the wedding dress and pursing up her small mouth into the most perfect and guarded expression of non-committal though she said afterwards it went to her heart to see how that poor young man did look sitting there just as noble and as handsome as a picture she didn't see for her part how anybody's heart could stand it then to be sure as mrs scudder said the poor doctor ought to be thought about dear blessed man what a pity it was things would turn out so not that it was a pity that jim came home that was a great providence but a pity they hadn't known about it sooner well for her part she didn't pretend to say the path of duty did have a great many hard places in it etc as for james during his interview at the cottage he waited and tried in vain for one moment's solitary conversation mrs scudder was immovable in her motherly kindness sitting there smiling and chatting with him but never stirring from her place by mary madame de frontignac was out of all patience and determined in her small way to do something to discompose the fixed state of things so retreating to her room she contrived in very desperation to upset and break a wash pitcher shrieking violently in french and english at the deluge which came upon the sanded floor and the little piece of carpet by the bedside what housekeeper's instincts are proof against the crash of breaking china mrs scudder fled from her seat followed by miss prissy ah then and there was hurrying to and fro while mary sat quiet as a statue bending over her sewing and james knowing that it must be now or never was like a flash in the empty chair by her side with his black moustache very near the bent brown head mary he said you must let me see you once more all is not said is it just hear me hear me once alone oh james i am too weak i dare not i am afraid of myself you think he said that you must take this course because it is right but is it right is it right to marry one man when you love another better i don't put this to your inclination mary i know it would be of no use i put it to your conscience oh i never was so perplexed before said mary i don't know what i do think i must have time to reflect and you oh james you must let me do right there will never be any happiness for me if i do wrong nor for you either all this while the sounds of running and hurrying in madame de frontignac's room had been unintermitted and miss prissy not without some glimmerings of perception into the state of things was holding tight on to mrs scudder's gown detailing to her a most capital receipt for mending broken china the history of which she traced regularly through all the families in which she had ever worked varying the details with small items of family history and little incidents as to the births marriages and deaths of different people for whom it had been employed with all the particulars of how where and when so that the time of james for conversation was by this means indefinitely extended now he said to mary let me propose one thing let me go to the doctor and tell him the truth james it does not seem to me that i can a friend who has been so considerate so kind 
so self-sacrificing and disinterested and whom i have allowed to go on with this implicit faith in me so long should you james think of yourself only i do not i trust think of myself only said james i hope that i am calm enough and have a heart to think for others but i ask you is it doing right to him to let him marry you in ignorance of the state of your feelings is it a kindness to a good and noble man to give yourself to him only seemingly when the best and noblest part of your affection is gone wholly beyond your control i am quite sure of that mary i know you do love him very well that you would make a most true affectionate constant wife to him but what i know you feel for me is something wholly out of your power to give to him is it not now i think it is said mary looking gravely and deeply thoughtful but then james i ask myself what if all this had happened a week hence my feelings would have been just the same because they are feelings over which i have no more control than over my existence i can only control the expression of them but in that case you would not have asked me to break my marriage vow and why now shall i break a solemn vow deliberately made before god if what i can give him will content him and he never knows that which would give him pain what wrong is done him i should think the deepest possible wrong done me said james if when i thought i had married a wife with a whole heart i found that the greater part of it had been before that given to another if you tell him or if i tell him or your mother who is the more proper person and he chooses to hold you to your promise then mary i have no more to say i shall sail in a few weeks again and carry your image for ever in my heart nobody can take that away and that dear shadow will be the only wife i shall ever know at this moment miss prissy came rattling along towards the door talking we suspect designedly in quite a high key mary hastily said wait james let me think to-morrow is the sabbath day monday i will send you word or see you and when miss prissy returned into the best room james was sitting at one window and mary at another he making remarks in a style of most admirable commonplace on a copy of milton's paradise lost which he had picked up in the confusion of the moment and which at the time mrs katy scudder entered he was declaring to be a most excellent book and a really truly valuable work mrs scudder looked keenly from one to the other and saw that mary's cheek was glowing like the deepest heart of a pink shell while in all other respects she was as cold and calm on the whole she felt satisfied that no mischief had been done we hope our readers will do mrs scudder justice it is true that she yet wore on her third finger the marriage ring of a sailor lover and his memory was yet fresh in her heart but even mothers who have married for love themselves somehow so blend their daughter's existence with their own as to conceive that she must marry their love and not her own besides this mrs scudder was an old testament woman brought up with that scrupulous exactitude of fidelity in relation to promises which would naturally come from familiarity with a book where covenant-keeping is represented as one of the highest attributes of deity and covenant-breaking as one of the vilest sins of humanity to break the word that had gone forth out of one's mouth was to lose self-respect and all claim to the respect of others and to sin against eternal rectitude as we have said before it is almost impossible to make our light-minded modern times comprehend the earnestness with which these people lived it was in the beginning no vulgar or mercenary ambition that made mrs scudder desire the doctor as a husband for her daughter he was poor and she had had offers from richer men he was often unpopular but he was the man in the world she most revered the man she believed in with the most implicit faith the man who embodied her highest idea of the good and therefore it was that that she was willing to resign her child to him as to james she had felt truly sympathetic with his mother and with mary in the dreadful hour when they supposed him lost and had it not been for the great perplexity occasioned by his return she would have received him as a relative with open arms but now she felt it her duty to be on the defensive an attitude not the most favorable for cherishing pleasing associations in regard to another she had read the letter giving an account of his spiritual experience with very sincere pleasure 
as a good woman should but not without an internal perception how very much it endangered her favourite plans but when mary had calmly reiterated her determination she felt sure of her for had she ever known her to say a thing she did not do the uneasiness she felt at present was not the doubt of her daughter's steadiness but the fear that she might have been unsuitably harassed or annoyed End of section 42section 43 of the minister's wooing this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the minister's wooing by harriet beecher stowe chapter 38 the next morning rose calm and fair it was the sabbath day the last sabbath in mary's maiden life if her promises and plans were fulfilled Mary dressed herself in white, her hands trembling with unusual agitation, her sensitive nature divided between two opposing consciences and two opposing affections. Her devoted filial love towards the doctor made her feel the keenest sensitiveness at the thought of giving him pain. At the same time, the questions which James had proposed to her had raised serious doubts in her mind whether it was altogether right to suffer him blindly to enter into this union. So after she was all prepared, she bolted the door of her chamber, and opening her Bible, read, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given. And then, kneeling down by the bed, she asked that God would give her some immediate light in her present perplexity. So praying, her mind grew calm and steady, and she rose up at the sound of the bell, which marked that it was time to set forward for church. Everybody noticed, as she came into the church that morning, how beautiful Mary Scudder looked. It was no longer the beauty of the carved statue, the pale alabaster shrine, the sainted virgin, but a warm, bright, living light that spoke of some summer breath breathing within her soul. When she took her place in the singer's seat, she knew, without turning her head, that he was in his old place not far from her side, and those whose eyes followed her to the gallery marveled at her face, where the pure and eloquent blood spoke in her cheeks, and so divinely wrought that you might almost say her body thought, for a thousand delicate nerves were becoming vital once more, as the holy mystery of womanhood wrought within her. When they rose to sing, the tune must needs be one which Mary and James had often sung together out of the same book at the singing school. One of those wild, pleading tunes dear to the heart of New England, born, if we may credit the report, in the rocky hollow of its mountains, and whose notes have a kind of grand and mournful triumph in their warbling wail. The different parts of the harmony said contrary to all the canons of musical pharisaism had still a singular and romantic effect which a true musical genius would not have failed to recognize the four parts tenor treble bass and counter as they were then called rose and swelled and wildly mingled with the fitful strangeness of an aeolian harp or of wings in mountain hollows or the vague moanings of the sea on lone, forsaken shores. And Mary, while her voice rose over the waves of the treble and trembled with a pathetic richness, felt to her inmost heart the deep accord of that other voice which came to meet hers, so wildly melancholy, as if the soul in that manly breast had come forth to meet her soul in the disembodied shadow in verity of eternity. That grand new tune called by our fathers China, never with its dirge-like melody, drew two souls more out of themselves and entwined them more nearly with each other. The last verse of the hymn spoke of the resurrection of the saints with Christ. Then let the last dread trumpet sound, and bid the dead arise. Awake, ye nations underground, ye saints, ascend the skies. And as Mary sang, 
she felt sublimely abhorred with the idea that life is but a moment, and love is immortal, and seemed in a shadowy trance to feel herself and him past this mortal pain far over on the shores of that other life, ascending with Christ, all glorified, all tears wiped away, and with full permission to love and to be loved forever. And as she sang, the doctor looked upward and marvelled at the light in her eyes and the rich bloom on her cheek, for where she stood, a sunbeam streaming aslant through the dusty panes of the window, touched her head with a kind of glory, and the thought he then received outbreathed itself in the yet more fervent adoration of his prayer. End of chapter thirty-eight. Section forty-four of the Minister's Wooing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Minister's Wooing by Harriet Beecher Stowe, Chapter Thirty-Nine. Our fathers believed in special answers to prayer. They were not stumbled by the objection about the inflexibility of the laws of nature, because they had the idea that when the Creator of the world promised to answer human prayers, he probably understood the laws of nature as well as they did. At any rate, the laws of nature were his affairs and not theirs. They were men very apt, as the Duke of Wellington said, to look to their marching orders, which, being found to read, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God, they did it. They looked unto him, and were likened, and their faces were not ashamed. One reads in the memoirs of Dr. Hopkins how Newport Gardner, one of his African catechumens, a negro of singular genius and ability, being desirous of his freedom, that he might be a missionary to Africa, and having long worked, without being able to raise the amount required, was counselled by Dr. Hopkins that it might be a shorter way to seek his freedom from the Lord, by a day of solemn prayer and fasting. The historical fact is, that on the evening of a day so consecrated, his master returned from church, called Newport to him, and presented him with his freedom. Is it not possible that he who made the world may have established laws for prayer as invariable as those for the sowing of seed and raising of grain? Is it not as legitimate a subject of inquiry when petitions are not answered, which of these laws has been neglected? But be that as it may, certain it is that a train of events was set in operation this day which went directly towards answering Mary's morning supplication for guidance. Candice, who on this particular morning had contrived to place herself where she could see Mary and James in the singer's seat, had certain thoughts borne in on her mind, which bore fruit afterwards in a solemn and select conversation held with Miss Prissy at the end of the horse-shed by the meeting-house during the intermission between the morning and afternoon sermons. Candace sat on a fragment of a granite boulder which lay there, her black face relieved against a clump of yellow mulleins, then in majestic altitude. On her lap was spread a check pocket handkerchief, containing rich slices of cheese and a store of her favourite brown doughnuts. Now Miss Prissy, she said, there's reason in all things, and a good deal more in some things than there is in others. There's a good deal more reason in two young handsome folk coming together than there is in... Candice finished the sentence by an emphatic flourish of her doughnut. Now as long as everybody thought Massa Jim was dead, there weren't nothing in the world else to be done but for Miss Mary to marry the doctor. But, good Lord, I heard him a-talkin' to Mrs. Marvin last night. It kind o' most broke my heart. Why, them poor two creatures 
Dey's just as unhappy as Dey can be, and she's got too much feeling for the doctor to say a word. And I say he ought to be told on it. That's what I say," said Candice, giving a decisive bite to her doughnut. I say so too," said Miss Prissy. "Why, I never had such feelings in my life as I did yesterday, when that young man came down to our house. He was just as pale as a cloth. I tried to say a word to Missus Scudder, but she snapped me up so. She's an awfully decided woman when her mind's made up. I was telling Carinthia Ann Twitchell, she come round me this morn, that it didn't exactly seem to me right that things should go on as they're gone on to. And says I, Carinthia Ann, I don't know anything about what to do. And she says, If I was you, Miss Prissy. I know what I'd do. I'd tell the doctor. Says she, Nobody ever takes offence at anything you do, Miss Prissy. To be sure, added Miss Prissy, I have talked to people about a good many things, that it's rather strange I should, cause I ain't one somehow that can let things go that seem to want doing. I always told folks that I should spoil a novel before it got half way through the first volume. By blurting out some of those things that they let trailing on, till every one gets so mixed up they don't know what they're doing. Well, now, honey," said Candice authoritatively, "if you've got any notion of that kind, I think it must have come from de good Lord, and I advise ye to be tendin' to it right away. You just go along and tell the doctor yourself all you knows, and then let's see what'll come of it. I tell you, I believes it'll be one of the best day's works." You ever did in your life? Well," said Miss Prissy, "I guess tonight, before I go to bed, I'll make a dive at him. When a thing's once out, it's out, and it can't be got in again, even if people don't like it. And that's a mercy, anyhow. It really makes me feel most wicked to think of it, for the doctor is a blessed man. That's what he is," said Candice. But den de blessedest man in the world ought for to know de truth. That's what I think. Yes, true enough," said Miss Prissy. "I'll tell him anyway." Miss Prissy was as good as her word, for that evening when the doctor had retired to his study, she took her light in her hand, and walking softly as a cat, tapped rather timidly at the study door, which the doctor opening, said benignantly, "Ah, Miss Prissy." If you please, sir," said Miss Prissy, "I'd like a little conversation." The doctor was well enough used to such requests from the female members of his church, which generally were the prelude to some disclosures of internal difficulties or spiritual experiences. He therefore graciously motioned her to a chair. "I thought I must come in," she began, busily twirling a bit of her Sunday gown. "I thought." That is, I felt it my duty. I, I thought uh, perhaps I ought to tell you that perhaps you ought to know. The doctor looked civilly concerned. He did not know, but Miss Prissy's wits were taking leave of her. He replied, however, with his usual honest stateliness, "I trust, dear madam, that you will feel at perfect freedom to open to me any exercises of mind that you may have." It isn't about myself," said Prissy. If you please, it's about you, sir, and Mary. The doctor now looked awake in right earnest and very much astonished beside, and he looked eagerly at Miss Prissy to have her go on. I don't know how you would view such a matter," said Miss Prissy, "but the fact is that James Marvin and Mary always did love each other since they were children." Still, the doctor was unawakened to the real meaning of the words. And he answered simply, "I should be far from wishing to interfere with so very natural and innocent a sentiment, which I make no doubt is all quite as it should be." No, but said Miss Prissy, "You don't understand what I mean. I mean that James Marvin wanted to marry Mary, and that she was—well, she wasn't engaged to him, but—" "Madam," said the doctor in a voice that frightened Miss Prissy out of her chair. While a blaze like sheet lightning shot from his eyes, and his face flushed crimson. Mercy on us, doctor! I hope you'll excuse me, but there, 
the fact is out i've said it out the fact is they wasn't engaged but that mary loved him ever since he was a boy as she never will and never can love any man again in this world is what i'm just as sure of as that i'm standing here and i felt you ought to know it cause i'm quite sure that if he'd been alive she'd never have given the promise she has the promise that she means to keep if her heart breaks and his too there wouldn't any one tell you and i thought i must tell you cause i thought you'd know what was right to do about it during all this latter speech the doctor was standing with his back to miss prissy and his face to the window just as he did some time before when mrs scudder came to tell him of mary's consent he made a gesture backward without speaking that she should leave the apartment and miss prissy left with a guilty kind of feeling as if she had been plunging a knife into her pastor and rushing distractedly across the entry into mary's little bedroom she bolted the door threw herself on the bed and began to cry well i've done it she said to herself he's a very strong hearty man she had soliloquized so i hope it won't put him in a consumption men do go in a consumption about such things sometimes i remember abner seaforth did but then he was always narrow-chested and had the liver complaint or something i don't know what mrs scudder will say but i've done it poor man such a good man too i declare i feel just like herod taking off john the baptist's head well well it's done and it can't be helped just at this moment miss prissy heard a gentle tap at the door and started as if it had been a ghost not being able to rid herself of the impression that somehow she had committed a great crime for which retribution was knocking at the door it was mary who said in her sweetest and most natural tones miss prissy the doctor would like to see you mary was much astonished at the frightened discomposed manner with which miss prissy received this announcement and said i'm afraid i've waked you up out of sleep i don't think there's the least hurry miss prissy didn't either but she reflected afterwards that she may as well get through with it at once and therefore smoothing her tumbled cap border she went to the doctor's study this time he was quite composed and received her with a mournful gravity and requested her to be seated i beg madam he said you will excuse the abruptness of my manner in our late interview i was so little prepared for the communication you had to make that i was perhaps unsuitably discomposed will you allow me to ask whether you were requested by any of the parties to communicate to me what you did no sir said miss prissy have any of the parties ever communicated with you on the subject at all said the doctor no sir said miss prissy that is all said the doctor i will not detain you i am very much obliged to you madam he rose and opened the door for her to pass out and miss prissy overawed by the stately gravity of his manner went out in silence end of section forty four Section 45 of The Minister's Wooing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Minister's Wooing by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter 40. When Miss Prissy left the room, the doctor sat down by the table and covered his face with his hands. He had a large, passionate, determined nature, and he had just come to one of those cruel crises in life, in the which it is apt to seem to us that the whole force of all our being, all that we can hope, or wish, or feel, has been suffered to gather itself into one great wave, only to break upon some cold rock of inevitable fate, and go back moaning into emptiness. In such hours men and women have cursed God and life, 
and thrown violently down, and trampled under their feet what yet was left of life's blessings, in the fierce bitterness of despair. This or nothing, the soul shrieks in her frenzy. At just such points as these, men have plunged into intemperance and wild excess. They have gone to be shot down in battle. They have broken life, and thrown it away like an empty goblet, and gone like wailing ghosts out into the dread unknown. The possibility of all this lay in that heart which has just received that stunning blow. Exercised and disciplined as he had been, by years of sacrifice, by constant, unsleeping self-vigilance, there was rising there in that great heart an ocean tempest of passion, and for a while his cries unto God seemed as empty and as vague as the screams of birds, tossed and buffeted in the clouds of mighty tempests. The will that he thought wholly subdued seemed to rise under him as a rebellious giant. A few hours before he thought himself established in an invincible submission to God that nothing could shake. Now he looked into himself as into a seething vortex of rebellion, and against all the passionate cries of his lower nature he could only, in the language of an old saint, cling to God by the naked force of his will. That will was as determined and firm as that of Aaron Burr. It rested unmelted amid the boiling sea of passion, waiting its hour of renewed sway. He walked the room for hours, and then sat down to his Bible, and wakened once or twice to find his head leaning on its pages, and his mind far gone in thoughts from which he woke with a bitter throb. Then he determined to set himself to some definite work, and taking his concordance, began busily tracing out and numbering all the proof-texts for one of the chapters of his theological system, till at last he worked himself down to such calmness that he could pray, and then he schooled and reasoned himself in a style not unlike, in its spirit, to what a great modern author has addressed to suffering humanity, what is it that thou art fretting and self-tormenting about? Is it because thou art not happy? Who told thee that thou wast to be happy? Is there any ordinance of the universe that thou shouldst be happy? Art thou nothing but a vulture screaming for prey? Canst thou not do without happiness? Yea, thou canst do without happiness, and instead thereof find blessedness. The doctor came lastly to the conclusion that blessedness, which was all the portion his master had on earth, might do for him also, and therefore he kissed and blessed that silver dove of happiness, which he saw was weary of sailing in his clumsy old ark, and let it go out of his hand without a tear. He slept little that night, but when he came to breakfast, all noticed an unusual gentleness and benignity of manner, and Mary, she knew not why, saw tears rising in his eyes when he looked at her. After breakfast he requested Mrs. Scudder to step with him into his study, and Miss Prissy shook in her little shoes as she saw the matron entering. The door was shut for a long time, and two voices could be heard in earnest conversation. Meanwhile, James Marvin entered the cottage, prompt to remind Mary of her promise that she would talk with him again this morning. They had talked with each other but a few moments by the sweet briar shaded window in the best room, when Mrs. Scudder appeared at the door of the apartment, with traces of tears upon her cheeks. "'Good morning, James,' she said. The doctor wishes to see you and Mary a moment together." Both looked sufficiently astounded, knowing from Mrs. Scudder's looks that something was impending. They followed Mrs. Scudder, scarcely feeling the ground they trod on. 
the doctor was sitting at his table, with his favourite large print Bible open before him. He rose to receive them with a manner at once gentle and grave. There was a pause of some minutes, during which he sat with his head leaning on his hand. "'You all know,' he said, turning towards Mary, who sat very near him, "'the near and dear relation in which I have been expected to stand towards this friend. I should not have been worthy of that relation if I had not felt in my heart the true love of a husband, as set forth in the New Testament, who should love his wife even as Christ loved the church, and gave himself for it. And if in case any peril or danger threatened this dear soul, and I could not give myself for her, I had never been worthy the honour she has done me. For I take it wherever there is a cross or burden to be borne by one or the other, that the man who is made in the image of God, as to strength and endurance, should take it upon himself, and not lay it upon her that is weaker. For he is therefore strong, not that he may tyrannise over the weak, but bear their burdens for them, even as Christ for his church. I have just discovered, he added, looking kindly upon Mary, that there is a great cross and burden which must come either on this dear child or on myself, through no fault of either of us, but through God's good providence, and therefore let me bear it. Mary, my dear child, he said, I will be to thee as a father, but I will not force thy heart. At this moment, Mary, by a sudden impulsive movement, threw her arms around his neck and kissed him, and lay sobbing on his shoulder. No, no, she said, I will marry you as I said. Not if I will not, dear, he said with a benign smile. Come here, young man, he said with some authority to James. I give thee this maiden to wife. And he lifted her from his shoulder and placed her gently in the arms of the young man, who, overawed and overcome, pressed her silently to his heart. "'There, children, it is over,' he said. "'God bless you. Take her away,' he added. "'She will be more composed soon.' Before James left, he grasped the doctor's hand in his, and said, "'Sir, this tells on my heart more than any sermon you ever preached.' I shall never forget it. God bless you, sir. The doctor saw them slowly quit the apartment, and following them, closed the door. And thus ended the minister's wooing. End of section 45「All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. » The Minister's Wooing by Harriet Beecher Stowe Chapter 41 Of the events which followed this scene, we are happy to give our readers more minute and graphic details than we ourselves could furnish, by transcribing for their edification an autograph letter of Miss Prissy's still preserved in a black oaken cabinet of our great-grandmothers, and with which we take no further liberties than the correction of a somewhat peculiar orthography. It is written to that sister Martha in Boston, of whom she has made such frequent mention, and who, it appears, it was her custom to keep posted up in all the gossip of her immediate sphere. My dear sister, you wonder, I suppose, why I haven't written you, but the fact is, I've been run just off my feet, and worked till the flesh aches so. It seems as if it would drop off my bones with this wedding of Mary Scudder's, and, after all, you'll be astonished to hear that she hadn't married the doctor, but that Jim Marvin that I told you about, who had such a wonderful escape from shipwreck. You see, he came home a week before the wedding was to be, 
and Mary, she was so conscientious, she thought twan't right to break it off with the doctor, and so she was for going right on with it. And Mrs. Scudder, she was for going on more yet. And the poor young man, he couldn't get a word in edgeways, and there wouldn't be anybody tell the doctor a word about it. And there twas drifting along, and both of them feeling dreadfully, and so I thought to myself, I'll just take my life in my hand, like Queen Esther, and go in and tell the doctor all about it. And so I did. I'm scared to death always when I think of it. But that dear blessed man, he took it like a saint. He just gave her up as serene and calm as a psalm book, and called James in, and told him to take her. Jim was fairly overcrowed. It really made him feel small, and he says he'll agree that there is more in the doctor's religion than most men's, which shows how important it is for professing Christians to bear testimony in their works. As I was telling Corinthian Twitchell, and she said there weren't anything that made her want to be a Christian so much, if that was what religion would do for people. Well, you see, when this came out, it wanted just three days of the wedding which was to be Thursday, and that wedding dress I told you about, that had lilies of the valley on a white ground, was pretty much made, except puffing the gauze round the neck, which I do with white satin piping cord, and it looks beautiful too. And so Mrs. Scudder and I, we were thinking, twould do just as well, when in came Jim Marvin, bringing the sweetest thing you ever saw, that he had got in China, and I think I never did see anything lovelier. It was a white silk, as thick as a board, and so stiff that it would stand alone, and overshot with little fine dots of silver, so that it shone when you moved it, just like frost work. And when I saw it I just clapped my hands, and jumped up from the floor, and says I, If I have to sit up all night, that dress shall be made, and made well too. For, you know, I thought I could get Miss Ollodine Hokum to run the breadth and do such parts, so that I could devote myself to the fine work. And that French woman I told you about, she said she'd help, and she's a master hand for touching things up. There seems to be work provided for all kinds of people, and French people seem to have a gift in all sorts of dressy things, and tisn't a bad gift either. Well, as I was saying, we agreed that this was to be cut open with a train, and a petticoat of just the palest, sweetest, loveliest blue that you ever saw, and gauze puffings down the edges each side, fastened in every once in a while, with lilies of the valley, and twas cut square in the neck, with puffing and flowers to match, and then tight sleeves with full ruffles of that old Mechlin lace that you remember Mrs. Katie Scudder showed you once in that great camphorwood trunk. Well, you see, come to get all things together that were to be done, we concluded to put the wedding off till Tuesday, and Madame de Frontignac, she would dress the best room for it herself, and she spent nobody knows what time in going round and getting evergreens and making wreaths and putting up green boughs over the pictures, so that the room looked just like the Episcopal Church at Christmas. In fact, Mrs. Scudder said, if it had been Christmas, she wouldn't have felt it right, because it would have been like encouraging prelacy. But as it was, she didn't think anybody would think it any harm. Well, Tuesday night, I and Madame de Frontignac, we dressed Mary ourselves, and I tell you the dress fitted as if it twas grown on her, and Madame de Frontignac, she dressed her hair, she had on a wreath of lilies of the valley, and a gauze veil that came almost down to her feet, and came all around her like a cloud, and you could see her white shining dress through it every time she moved, and she looked just as white as a snowberry, but there were two little pink spots that came coming and going in her cheeks, that kind of lightened up when she smiled, and then faded down again and the French lady put a string of real pearls round her neck, with a cross of pearls, which went down and lay hid in her bosom. She was mighty calm-like while she was being dressed, 
but just as I was putting in the last pin, she started, for she heard the rumbling of a coach downstairs, for Jim Marvin had got a real elegant carriage to carry her over to his father's in, and so she knew he was come, and pretty soon Mrs. Marvin came in the room, and when she saw Mary, her brown eyes kind of danced, and she lifted up both hands to see how beautiful she looked. And Jim Marvin, he was standing at the door, and they told him it wasn't proper that he should see till the time come, but he begged so hard that he might just have one peep that I let him come in, and he looked at her as if she was something he wouldn't dare to touch, and he said to me softly, says he, I'm most afraid she's got wings somewhere that will fly away from me, or that I shall wake up and find it is a dream. Well. Trinthy Ann Twitchell was the bridesmaid, and she came next with that young man she's engaged to. It is all out now that she is engaged, and she don't deny it. And Corinthy, she looked handsomer than I ever saw her, in a white brocade with rosebuds on it, which I guess she got in reference to the future, for they say she is going to be married next month. Well, we all filled up the room pretty well, till Mrs. Scudder came in to tell us that the company were all together, and then they took hold of arms, and then they had a little time practising how they must stand, and Corinthian's bow would always get her on the wrong side, because he's rather bashful, and don't know very well what he's about, and Corinthian declared she was afraid that she would laugh out in prayer time, because she always did laugh when she knew she mustn't. But finally Mrs. Scudder told us we must go in and looked so reprovingly at Corinthy that she had to hold her mouth with her pocket handkerchief. Well, the old doctor was standing there in the very silk gown that the ladies gave him to be married in himself. Poor dear man! And he smiled kind of peaceful on them when they came in, and walked up to a kind of bower of evergreens and flowers that Madame de Frontignac had fixed up for them to stand in. Mary grew rather white as if she was going to faint. But Jim Marvin stood up as firm and looked as proud and handsome as a prince. And he kind of looked down at her, cause, you know, he is a great deal taller, kind of wondering as if he wanted to know if it really was so. Well, when they all got placed, they let the door stand open, and Cato and Candice came and stood in the door. And Candice had on her great splendid Mogador turban, and a crimson and yellow shawl that she seemed to take comfort in wearing, although it was pretty hot. Well, so when they were all fixed, the doctor began his prayer, and as most of all us knew what a great sacrifice he had made, I don't believe there was a dry eye in the room, and when he had done there was a great time, people blowing their noses and wiping their eyes, as if it had been a funeral. Then Corinthian she pulled off Mary's glove pretty quick, but that poor bow of hers, he made such work of James's that he had to pull it off himself after all, and Corinthian she liked to have laughed out loud. And so, when the doctor told him to join hands, Jim took hold of Mary's hand, as if he didn't mean to let go very soon, and so they were married, and I was the first one that kissed the bride after Mrs. Scudder. I got that promise out of Mary when I was making the dress. And Jim Marvin, he insisted on kissing me, cause, says he, Miss Prissy, you are as young and handsome as any of them. And I told him he was a saucy young fellow, and I'd box his ears if I could reach him. That French lady looked lovely, dressed in pale pink silk, with long pink wreaths of flowers in her hair. And she came up and kissed Mary and said something to her in French, and after a while old Candice came up, and Mary kissed her, and then Candice put her arms around Jim's neck, and gave him a real hearty smack, so that everybody laughed, and then the cake and the wine was passed around, and everybody had good times till we heard the nine o'clock bell ring, and then came the coach up to the door, and Mrs. Scudder she wrapped Mary up, kissing her and crying over her, while Mrs. Marvin stood stretching her arms out of the coach after her, and then Cato and Candice went after in the wagon behind, and so they all went off together, 
and that was the end of the wedding. And ever since then we hadn't any of us done much but rest, for we were pretty much tired out. So no more at present from your affectionate sister, Prissy. P.S. To Miss Prissy's letter. I forgot to tell you that Jim Marvin has come home quite rich. He fell in with a man in China who was at the head of one of their great merchant houses, whom he had nursed through a long fever and took care of his business. And so when he got well, nothing would do but he must have him for a partner. And now he is going to live in this country and attend to the business of the house here. They say he is going to build a house as grand as the Vernons, and we hope he has experienced religion and he means to join our church, which is a providence, for he is twice as rich and generous as that old Simon Brown that snapped me up so about my wages. I never believed in him for all his talk. I was down to Mrs. Scudder's when the doctor examined Jim about his evidences. At first the doctor seemed a little anxious, because he didn't talk in the regular way. For you know Jim always did have his own way of talking, and never could say things in other people's words. And sometimes he makes folks laugh when he, he himself don't know what they laugh at, because he hits the nail on the head in some strange way they aren't expecting. If I was to have died, I couldn't help laughing at some things, he said, and yet I don't think I ever felt more solemnised. He sat up there in a sort of grand, straightforward, noble way, and told us all the way the Lord had been leading of him, and all the exercises of his mind, and all about the dreadful shipwreck, and how he was saved, and the loving kindness of the Lord, till the doctor's spectacles got all blinded with tears, and he couldn't see the notes he made to examine him by. And we all cried, Miss Scudder, and Mary, and I. And as to Miss Marvin, she just sat with her hands clasped, looking into her son's eyes, like a picture of the Virgin Mary. And when Jim got through, there wasn't nothing to be heard for some minutes. And the doctor, he wiped his eyes and wiped his glasses, and looked over his papers. But he couldn't bring out a word. And at last, says he, let us pray, for that was all there was to be said. For I think sometimes, for I think sometimes, things so kind of fills folk up that there ain't nothing to be done but pray, which the Lord be praised, we are privileged to do always. Between you and I, Martha, I could never understand all the distinctions our dear blessed doctor sets up, and when he publishes his system, if I work my fingers to the bone, I mean to buy one and study it out, because he is such a blessed man, though after all said I have to come back to my old place and trust in the loving kindness of the Lord, who takes care of the sparrow on the housetop and all small lone creatures like me, though I can't say I'm alone either, because no one needs say that so long as there's folks to be done for. So if I don't understand the doctor's theology, or don't get eyes to read it on account of the fine stitching on his shirt ruffles I've been trying to do, still I hope I may be accepted on account of the Lord's great goodness, for if we can't trust that, it's all over with us all. End of section 46section 47 of the minister's wooing this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the minister's wooing by harriet beecher stowe chapter 42 we know it is fashionable to drop the curtain over a new married pair as they recede from the altar but we cannot but hope our readers may have by this time enough of interest in our little history to wish for a few words on the lot of the personages whose acquaintance they have thereby made the conjectures of miss prissy in regard to the house which was to be built for the new married pair were as speedily as possible realized on a beautiful elevation a little out of the town of newport rose a fair and stately mansion whose windows overlooked the harbour and whose wide cool rooms were adorned by the constant presence of the sweet face and form which had been the guiding star of our story. The fair poetic maiden, the seeress, the saint, 
has passed into that appointed shrine for women, more holy than cloister, more saintly and pure than church or altar, a Christian home. Priestess, wife and mother, there she ministers daily in holy works of household peace, and by faith and prayer love redeems from grossness and earthliness the common toils and wants of life. The gentle guiding force that led James Marvin from the maxims and habits and ways of this world to the higher conception of an heroic and Christ-like manhood was still ever present with him, touching gently the springs of life, brooding peacefully with dove-like wings over his soul, and he grew up under it, noble in purpose and strong in spirit. He was one of the most energetic and fearless supporters of the doctor in his lifelong warfare against an inhumanity which was entrenched in all the mercantile interest of the day and which at last fell before the force of conscience and moral appeal candace in time transferred her allegiance to the growing family of her young master and mistress and predominated proudly in gorgeous raiment and butterfly turban over a rising race of young marvins all the cares not needed by them were bestowed on the somewhat garrulous old age of cato whose never-failing cough furnished occupation for all her spare hours and thought as for our friend the doctor we trust our readers will appreciate the magnanimity with which he proved a real and disinterested love in a point where so many men experience only the graspings of a selfish one a mind so severely trained as his brought to a great crisis involving severe self-denial an amount of reserved moral force quite inexplicable to those less habituated to self-control he was like a warrior whose sleep even was in armour always ready to be roused to the conflict in regard to his feelings for mary he made the sacrifice of himself to her happiness so wholly and thoroughly that there was not a moment of weak hesitation no going back over the past no vain regret generous and brave souls find support in such actions because the very exertion raises them to a higher and purer plane of existence his diary records the event only in these very calm and temperate words it was a trial to me a very great trial but as she did not deceive me i shall never lose my friendship for her the doctor was always a welcome inmate in the house of mary and james as a friend revered and dear nor did he want in time a hearthstone of his own where a bright and loving face made him daily welcome for we find that he married at last a woman of fair countenance and that sons and daughters grew up around him. In time, also, his theological system was published. In that day it was customary to dedicate new or important works to the patronage of some distinguished or powerful individual. The doctor had no earthly patron. Four or five simple lines are found in the commencement of his work, in which, in a spirit reverential and affectionate, he dedicates it to our Lord Jesus Christ, praying him to accept the good and overrule the errors to his glory. Quite unexpectedly to himself, the work proved a success, not only in public acceptance and esteem, but even in a temporal view, bringing to him at last a modest competence, which he accepted with surprise and gratitude. To the last of a very long life, he was the same steady, undiscouraged worker, the same calm witness against popular sins and proclaimer of unpopular truths, ever saying and doing what he saw to be eternally true and right, without the slightest consultation with worldly expediency or earthly gain. Nor did his words cease to work in New England till the evils he opposed were finally done away. Colonel Burr leaves the scene of our story to pursue those brilliant and unscrupulous political intrigues 
so well known to the historian of those times, and whose results were so disastrous to himself, his duel with the ill-fated Hamilton, and the awful retribution of public opinion that followed, the slow downward course of a doomed life, are all on record, chased from society, pointed at everywhere by the finger of hatred, so accursed in common esteem that even the publican who lodged him for a night refused to accept his money when he knew his name. Heart-stricken in his domestic relation, his only daughter taken by pirates, and dying in untold horrors, one seems to see in a doom so much above that of other men the power of his avenging nemesis for sins beyond those of ordinary humanity. But we who have learned of Christ may humbly hope that these crushing miseries in this life came not because he was a sinner above others, not in wrath alone, but that the prayers of the sweet saint who gave him to God even before his birth brought to him those friendly adversities that thus might be slain in his soul the evil demon of pride, which had been the opposing force to all that was noble within him. Nothing is more affecting than the account of the last hours of this man, whom a woman took in and cherished in his poverty and weakness, with that same heroic enthusiasm with which it was his lot to inspire so many women. This humble keeper of lodgings was told that if she retained Aaron Burr, all her other lodgers would leave. Let them do it then, she said, but he shall remain. In the same uncomplaining and inscrutable silence in which he had borne the reverses and miseries of his life, did this singular being pass through the shades of the dark valley. The New Testament was always under his pillow, and when alone he was often found reading it attentively. But of the result of that communion with higher powers he said nothing. Patient, gentle and grateful he was, as to all his inner history, entirely silent and impenetrable. He died with the request, which has a touching significance, that he might be buried at the feet of those parents whose sainted lives had finished so differently from his own. No further seek his errors to disclose, or draw his frailties from their dread abode. Shortly after Mary's marriage, Madame de Frontignac sailed with her husband to France, where they lived in a very retired way, on a large estate in the south of France. A close correspondence was kept up between her and Mary for many years, from which we shall give our readers a few extracts. The first is dated shortly after their return to France. At last, my sweet Marie, you behold us in peace after our wanderings. I wish you could see our lovely nest in the hills, which overlooks the Mediterranean, whose blue waters remind me of Newport Harbour and our old days there. Ah, my sweet saint, blessed was the day I first learned to know you, for it was you more than anything else that kept me back from sin and misery. I called you my Sibyl, dearest, because the Sibyl was a prophetess of divine things out of the church, and so are you. The Abbe says that all true devout persons in all persuasions belong to the true Catholic apostolic church, and will in the end be enlightened to know it. What do you think of that, ma belle? I fancy I see you look at me with your grave, innocent eyes, just as you used to, but you say nothing. I am far happier, ma Marie, than I ever thought I could be. I took your advice and told my husband all I had felt and suffered. It was a very hard thing to do, but I felt how true it was. As you said, there could be no real friendship without perfect truth at bottom. So I told him all, and he was very good and noble and helpful to me, and since then he has been so gentle and patient and thoughtful that no mother could be kinder, and I should be a very bad woman if I did not love him truly and dearly. I do. I must confess that there is still a weak, bleeding place in my heart that aches yet, 
but I try to bear it bravely, and when I am tempted to think myself very miserable, I remember how patiently you used to go about your housework and spinning in those sad days when you thought your heart was drowned in the sea, and I try to do like you. I have many duties to my servants and tenants, and mean to be a good chatelaine, and I find when I nurse the sick and comfort the poor that my sorrows seem lighter. But after all, Mary, I have lost nothing that was ever mine. Only my foolish heart has grown to something that it should not, and bleeds at being torn away. Nobody but Christ and his dear mother can tell what this sorrow is, but they know, and that is enough. The next letter is dated some three years after. You see me now, my Marie, a proud and happy woman. I was truly envious when you wrote me of the birth of your little son, but now the dear good God has sent me a sweet little angel to me, to comfort my sorrows and lie close to my heart. And since he came, all pain is gone. Ah, if you could see him. He has black eyes and lashes like silk and such little hands. Even his fingernails are all perfect, like little gems. And when he puts his little hand on my bosom, I tremble with joy. Since he came, I pray always, and the good God seems very near to me. Now I realise, as I never did before, the sublime thought that God revealed himself in the infant Jesus, and I bow before the manger of Bethlehem, where the holy babe was laid. What comfort, what adorable condescension for us mothers in that scene. My husband is so moved, he can scarce stay an hour from the cradle. He seems to look at me with a sort of awe, because I know how to care for this precious treasure that he adores without daring to touch. We are going to call him Henri, which is my husband's name, and that of his ancestors for many generations back. I vow for him an eternal friendship with the son of my little Marie, and I shall try and train him up to be a brave man and a true Christian. Ah, Marie, this gives me something to live for. My heart is full. A whole new life opens before me. Somewhat later, another letter announces the birth of a daughter, and later still, that of another son. But we shall only add one more written some years after, on hearing of the great reverse of popular feeling towards Burr, subsequently to his duel with the ill-fated Hamilton. Ma chère Marie, your letter has filled me with grief. My noble Henri, who already begins to talk of himself as my protector, these boys feel their manhood so soon, my Marie, saw by my face when I read your letter that something pained me and he would not rest till I told him something about it. Ah, Marie, how thankful I then felt that I had nothing to blush for before my son. How thankful for those dear children whose little hands had healed all the morbid places of my heart, so that I could think of all the past without a pang. I told Henri that the letter brought bad news of an old friend, but that it pained me to speak of it and you would have thought by the grave and tender way he talked to his mamma that the boy was an experienced man of forty, to say the least. But, Marie, how unjust is the world, how unjust both in praise and blame. Poor Burr was the petted child of society. Yesterday she doted on him, flattered him, smiled on his faults, and let him do what he would without reproof. Today she flouts and scorns and scoffs him, and refuses to see the least good in him. I know that man, Mary, and I know that sinful as he may be before infinite purity, he is not so much worse than all the other men of his time. Have I not been in America? I know Jefferson. I knew poor Hamilton. Peace be with the dead. Neither of them had lives that could bear the sort of trial to which Burrs is subjected, when every secret fault, failing and sin, is dragged out and held up without mercy. What man can stand? But I know what irritates the world, 
is that proud disdainful calm which will neither give sigh nor tear it was not he that killed poor hamilton but that he never seemed to care and, ah there is that evil demon of his life that cold stoical pride which haunts him like a faint but i know he does feel i know he is not as hard as heart as he tries to be i have seen too many real acts of pity to the unfortunate of tenderness to the weak of real love to his friends to believe that great have been his sins against our sex and god forgive that the mother of children should speak lightly of them but is not so susceptible a temperament and so singular a power to charm as he possessed to be taken into account in estimating his temptations because he is a sinning man it does not follow that he is a demon if any should have cause to think bitterly of him i should he trifled inexcusably with my deepest feelings he caused me years of conflict and anguish such as he little knows i was almost shipwrecked yet i will still say to the last that what i loved in him was a better self something really noble and good however concealed and perverted by pride ambition and self-will though all the world reject him i still have faith in his better nature and prayers that he may be led right at last there is at least one heart that will always intercede with god for him it is well known that for many years after burr's death the odium that covered his name was so great that no monument was erected lest it should become a mark for popular violence subsequently however in a mysterious manner a plain granite slab marked his grave by whom erected has never been known it was placed in the night by some friendly unknown hand a labourer in the vicinity who first discovered it found lying near the spot a small porte-monnaie which had perhaps been used in paying for the workmanship but it contained no papers that could throw any light on the subject except a fragment of the address of a letter on which was written henri de frontignac end of section 47 end of the minister's wooing by harriet beecher stowe